for both the people that do and don't understand the appeal. The popularity of My Little Pony and other large fandoms might be hard to grasp. In this video, I will be explaining what factors might have led to MLP's fandom to reach the level that it has. I am using MLP as a jumping off point to explore other fandoms and why they have reached such a level of attention in recent years. Part 1. My Little Pony History 2010 the Co Board of 4chan is dedicated to exploring Western comics and cartoons, and the people of Co obsess over them. They watched the show and were excited for it for a number of reasons. In the late 2000s, Co was having a dry spell. Not many new or good cartoons have come out around that time, and people were excited for anything new or good. This might not have been the case if MLP came out later. MLP was created by a team in part responsible for their own fond childhood memories. Lauren Frost and her husband worked on Powerpuff Girls in Dexter's lab, not to mention members of Frost's team worked on Samurai Jack. The older generations of MLP, think of the stereotypical image you'd see before this point, gave people low expectations for the show, and people expected it to be very bad and overly girly, thus making this generation look much better by comparison. Ko watched the first few episodes of an intent to whip on it, and it simply ended up better than expected. Expecting something to be really bad and find out it's not that bad can make it seem a lot better than it actually is. And they make good reaction images. Reaction images are important to 4chan culture. So, show turns out okay, a general is created and most of Code likes to watch MLP or at least give it attention. 2011 Keep in mind that 4chan is anti-furry, and some considered MLP to be furry. The furry community has a very long history on the internet since the World Wide Web became public in 1991. They have their own conventions and a bad stigma, being made fun of on the Animaniacs cartoon, Please, please, please get a life foundation! and being blamed for why the Tiny Toons show ended with stories of creepy fan mail, stalkers, and similar public stunts of indecency. April 1st Day was a 4chan event on April 1st, 2005, when a new board was created for furry content, called Fur, and two days later anyone who posted there was banned. This goes back even further to 2003, when a sub forum on Something Awful was created called a Furry Concentration Camp, where posters were labeled with a yellow star of YIF on it, and they were eventually banned, this event being known as the Lolocaust. The Google people had a general thread on B to talk about ponies so as to not bother with Ko, who were getting pissed with the many pony threads. The B-threads, or breads, were known for being very kind and open, being more of a chat room to talk about nothing in particular. This pissed off a lot of the B-tards, whose culture was built on hostility to overly offensive humor. Some B-tards, knowing how angry it made the rest of B, decided to use ponies as troll ammo for the purpose of creating disorder and making people angry, for humor's sake. Flame bait. Whether or not they enjoyed the show, they would still enjoy watching people fight over something like ponies. The thought of a little girl show being popular there was something a lot of people took issue with as it clashed with 4chan's culture. It was fun to be overly nice and always reference a girly show and then see the angry reactions of other people. 4chan was already desensitized to racism, pedophilia, gore, and so on, but raiding and trolling the ponies is more effective than any of those. While the label Brony can be interpreted as bro plus pony, some people would say it was easier to identify the trolls on B in 2011, than to represent B plus pony, or B plus bro plus pony, whatever. While the majority of fans that say the code didn't identify as brony, some prefer cults. Love and Tolerate, for example, was never other than the show. It was used by Ko to mock people who should post the general and then used by B for the same reason, though much more often. People started to get annoyed seeing colorful horses all over the site. Any sign of pony would reveal a thread, whether it be a trolling shitposting brony, a non poster who enjoyed the show, or just the use of a reaction image. Massive backlash had started and the moderators used their power to ban it from the site, driven the court to a general on Ko. The conflict between mods and the show's growing fanbase attracted attention and sparked up debates across multiple boards. Ponies quickly became a tool for trolling mods and those in the opposing camps, and needless to say, it all became a complete clusterfuck. Many remember a time where you could not get away from My Little Pony if you visited 4chan at all. One important actor is the website Know Your Meme. B created the Know Your Meme webpage on February 6, 2011. B used the Know Your Meme page as a personal gallery and filled it with every single reaction pic they could find back then. And that is why today, the gallery has over 200,000 images. When I originally looked into this in 2015, the Know Your Meme image gallery had a little over 800,000 images. So at the time, almost a quarter of the site was made up of images from one page, the MLP page. The result of this is that it made MLP trending for an entire year. That means it always appeared in the top bar as the trending meme for that year. Memebase even created a spin-off site called My Little Brony to hold all of Know Your Meme's content of MLP in July 2011, just five months after the page was created. Other bronies moved to sites like Ponychan and began spreading to DeviantArt and YouTube, where it reached a more popular counterculture stage of development, and made the mainstream more sympathetic for the brony cause. Known people would defend like an MLP for your average, nothing wrong with breaking gender roles. The media eats that stuff up. Since, well, it is a kid's show, 
ponies became popular with children and younger audiences who took the term brony for themselves. According to the Brony Research Project, over 70% of self-identified bronies today are under 20 years old, and most of them are teens. Two thousand twelve. By the time the mainstream, child friendly bronies were reaching cable media awareness, the first brony con was being made. Howard Stern used brony con to make all bronies look like sexual deviants that were creeps, and as a result, John Delancey, popular voice actor from the show, helped make a documentary to defend the bronies, and to make some extra cash, as the film was funded by bronies on Kickstarter. By then, bronies were known by everyone, and the rest is history. Part two. Why I like the show. For the record, I'm listing a lot of different reasons for people joining to the brony phenomenon. I'm not saying all these reasons apply to all individuals, but I'm sewing as many as I could think of to cover as many different people as I can. Community For a lot of people, the community itself is what makes people become fans. The optimistic Hugbox community is appealing to children as well as those who are socially inept and depressed. The feel-good nature can do wonders for those who might never be doing so well in life. It is a community that will accept anyone and support them, be a home for those who don't identify with any community. This is especially true for kids and teenagers. Children who have played video games will have Minecraft, Sonic, or Pokemon as their first game, which all have a community to connect to. And since they've never been a part of a community before, they will take this feeling of brotherly love seriously and latch onto it. Advertising People who want attention for their internet content will jump onto the bandwagon and make art, music, animations, and more for fans of the show, allowing their work to become popular that wouldn't be on its own. Cuteness The cute ponies have been described as Western Moe. But what is Moe? It is the Japanese character trait of cuteness exemplified by purity and innocence. Some elements may also include submission, humility, selflessness, self-sacrifice, and dependence. Anime influences are also clear in the composition of the show, such as the design of the eyes of the characters, the neotinous facial construction, and the typical anime stereotypes. But what is cuteness? An evolutionary theory suggests that cuteness is a survival mechanism to make features of younger humans and animals aesthetically pleasing so that people will need a feel to protect them. This might also explain why sometimes stupidity or weakness will be seen as cute. These cute features include heads disproportionately larger than the rest of the body, large eyes and small noses and so on. In the same way that the anime community loves cute girls and people look at cute cat videos online, people like to look at cute ponies for the sake of them being cute. The comparisons to Pokemon and Sonic can be seen. They have a unique aesthetic and atmosphere that makes it stand out from other media and are easily recognizable. A loop with a checkered pattern can be recognized as part of a Sonic level in its aesthetic. A Pokeball can recognize a part of Pokemon's design and aesthetic. Pokemon and Sonic also share with MLP a large amount of anthropomorphic creatures that allow people to easily create OCs, and the fun fantasy elements of these universes fuel escapism, projection, and the self-insert fanfiction. Anthropomorphism this is universal, and has been known as one of the most successful means of generating many character crosslinks for ages. Disney, DreamWorks, and nearly all the animation greats engage in it. Not only does it give them fun characteristics to work with, such as tail swats and the use of a mouth as a grabbing tool, but it creates direct behavior association in humans. See, we have these animalian emotions key to our mental understandings. We all know what a tail wagging dog means, or bristling cat, or shivering with the head lowered. These come to us normally, and are far more overt and obvious examples of emotional conveyance than the incredibly subtle ones human characters use, unless the characters are abstracted or super deformed, which exaggerates their emotions. Finally, it eliminates the problem of the uncanny valley. As it turns out, we don't like things that appear human without appearing 100% human. The phenomenon of the uncanny valley makes pseudo-humanity unappealing to us and forces us to distrust it. Those lanky, evil, marionette-looking things you see in every horror movie are exploiting this. Simply, getting away from human looks while keeping human appeal and emotions is a surefire way to have a character design be successful. The West's answer to this is anthropomorphic animals as characters. Counterculture a counterculture aspect to it makes people want to rebel against social norms, as well as armchair activism. People can feel that they are somehow fighting for an oppressed minority, as well as fighting the oppressive age and gender roles. People can finally be brave and special for admitting their love to the show in public. It gives people attention and validation that in some cases can manifest into attention whoring behavior. Nostalgia Co and animation nerds enjoyed it for the art style animations, as nostalgia for simple animation and stories can help them feel young and bring out their inner child. This cartoon is very reminiscent of the cartoons of the 80s and 90s. Even its name and core franchise are steeped in 80s and 90s nostalgia. Nostalgia appeals to various people for different reasons, but the base of it is that they want to escape their life and return to feeling the way they did as a child. Objects that resonate with a person's childhood leave strong impressions on that child as a grown-up. Either they long for the feeling of childhood, or the recoil from something that reminds them of the time they felt awkward and powerless. The latter is the reason why the generation younger than the fandom is such a fan of attacking it. 
Another element is that the show has a lot of characters with a lot of personalities. This allows people to identify with one who is similar to them, as well as pick favorites. Some other fandom examples like Naruto or Sonic have a lot, a lot of characters that people can identify with and pick favorites, and can also encourage shipping. Even if out an adult fanbase, MLP already would have had a large presence in the media thanks to being the Hasbro Toy Company's franchise of choice for little girls. Everyone knew what MLP was because they've seen it as a product for little girls since the 80s. In comparison to other fandoms, Lord of the Rings, Star Trek, Star Wars got a shitload of merchandising, and Sonic and Pokemon are very big franchises for Sega and Nintendo, so they're seen anywhere. And finally, people are just different. This may be hard for some of you to comprehend, but some people just have different tastes, and enjoy different forms of media than the rest of society. There are people that enjoy the Kardashians, Jersey Shore, Jerry Springer, Justin Bieber, Michael Bay, and athletes tossing around balls on national television. Enjoyment cannot always be rationally explained, and differs from person to person with the different perspectives of media in the world. I did my best to rationally explain the emotional reasons people might have for liking MLP in this video, but if at this point you still don't get it and still expect there to be some huge secret that would justify everything, it just won't happen. Put yourself in the shoes of a brony. Imagine if every time you mentioned you like Pokemon, people would say, how can you enjoy a game for 10 year old boys? You give reasons for liking it that would normally be considered valid, such as many unique Pokemon to choose from and encouraged customization as well as the community and cultural impact that came from it. But the person always says, that can't be it. This isn't normal. There must be some hidden reason that you are hiding that justifies this. Eventually you would realize that they will never accept any answer you give them except for I am insane because it is too strange to be justifiable in their mind. In short, there is no secret. No one wants to play the what is the real reason game and keep giving different reasons only for the person to say, well that reason doesn't apply to me so that can't be it. If you were in this position and had years of dealing with these type of people, your instinctive reaction to seeing another person asking, what is the appeal, might be along the lines of, I just like Pokemon because I find it fun. There is no secret, try playing it to see if you like it. And no, I'm not covering pony porn or clopping, I already did that in my fetish video so check that out if you want to see it. Part 3 other fandoms. So now, let's cover some other specific fandoms before I move on to explaining fandoms as a whole. Pokemon had genius marketing that allowed it to sell two versions of the video game, a card game and an anime. The trading element made Pokemon fans have more of a reason to hang out, as trading and fighting Pokemon became a catalyst for social interaction. This makes it have more importance to people and can lead to obsession in letting it define a person. It attracts the completionists and people who have set up with catching them all as well as people who want customization and more escapist elements than other games. It makes a commitment to Pokemon last more than one generation of the game. Satoshi Tajiri, the creator of Pokemon, has Asperger's and an autistic fixation on bugs. Sonic was made to compete against Mario, and was always marketed to be an artificial version of what cool is. With anime elements like Chaos Emeralds and Super Forms, Sonic was about a safe rebellion that attracted teens. Soundtracks from the 90s replicated new Jack Swing beats that were popular at the time, not to mention Michael Jackson made music for Sonic 3, and lyrical music beginning with Sonic Adventure was made by a band of rock, metal, and punk influences. The music sounded like stuff you might hear on the radio from that time, compared to other video game music. As Sonic was made to be a franchise that rivaled Mario, its media spanned across many games, shows, comics that cast a wide net to attract different people who are attracted to different incarnations of Sonic in his cool styles. This net of stories and universes are so diverse that it's impossible to connect them into one continuity, but it makes people obsess over the different incarnations of him and make a complex fictional universe that could connect these different worlds together. Lord of the Rings came out in the 50s and had a very large and complex world of multiple species and unique settings. Star Trek in the 60s and Star Wars in the 70s also had multiple species and planets with their own settings. These fictional universes are expanded even more with books, comics, shows, and other media. Star Wars was the first series that the producers realized how much money they could make with this, and it was the most mainstream of the three because of its expansive media with lots of toys and other forms of entertainment. J.R.R. Tolkien studied languages and made the elvish language as a hobby. The other two followed the fictional languages for Klingons, Mandalorians, and other species. Since there was so much content, fans coming together meant a lot more and they had more to talk about and build on. If the series only had one or two species that weren't very unique, like three guys on a planet of apes, they wouldn't have as much to work with, while these franchises had an ecosystem where every part of the universe works together with one another. And if we were to go further back before the 20th century to try to find the origins of this type of fictional settings in the universe, then the original fantasy world that is like this and achieved great success even today would probably be the mythology of the Greeks and other ancient cultures, with a lot of religions sharing concepts like this. These fantasy universes, and if you want to be an edgy atheist and we can say all religions, are used for escapism. 
But what is escapism? It is defined as seeking distraction and relief from unpleasant realities. It does not necessarily mean that one literally wants to escape from their lives, just that they want to distract themselves. Escapism is not defined by the behavior itself, but the motivation behind it. If you're like the 500 million people alive today who have logged at least 10,000 hours in a single game, you might be doing it to distract yourself from reality. If you played those games as a stress reliever or as a way to spend time with friends, then it might not be escapism because the intention isn't to escape. If you are merely trying to make negative feelings go away, and you do it reflexively, then you are practicing escapism. If you use fantasy as an occasional means of taking a mental break or to gain some insights to bring back into reality, then it is fine. And escapism isn't defined as a bad thing. Anything from sports, fashion, sex, celebrity worship, and recreational drug use can become escapist activities. Means of this have become increasingly varied over the past few decades, but fascination and details remains a popular one. Fictional characters and Mary Sue's are often the ideal version of the author or people the author wants to be with. Humor and tragedy rely on the suffering of others so that people forget their troubles or see it in a more positive perspective. And apocalyptic scenarios like zombies make people feel like they're important enough to survive when many others are dead. Part 4 Conclusion The way I see it, the main factors of a fictional story that attract these type of people are 1. Must be set in a fictional universe separate from ours, as to encourage and escape his fantasies as well as a lot of elements of the universe to work with. 2. Must have a unique aesthetic that is easily recognizable. 3. Must have multiple species of characters, as well as many types of characters that people can identify with and pick favorites. 4. Must have some element of nostalgia, it be the first thing people get into. 5. Must be popular enough for most people to recognize it, to have brand recognition. People with obsessive elements like this tend to have the containing character strategy. They do not feel welcome in the world they are from and tend to have awkward social skills. Often, spirituality and or fantasy give them comfort and allow them to fit within the community. While these communities can help them open up and be more social, it can also prevent them from expanding past the community when they use it like a shield. I believe these people are becoming more common now than in the past because of three factors a more safe and productive culture that leads to productive parenting, sometimes attributed to the post-9-11 culture of wanting security, an increase in technology that prevents the need for physical social interaction, which allows for more simplified and abstract socializing online, a turn away from traditional values that lead to individualism and experimenting. After television was introduced to the home, families began to follow and imitate the families on TV. The constant of television brought many families together to bond and create a community of similar values, much like religion. Religion helped bring people together who otherwise wouldn't have for centuries, and has been an important component to community and society. People would have a lot more of a connection with their neighbors if they met them at church every Sunday and got together for rituals like holidays and funerals. After a tragedy like 9-11, religion and patriotism were seen everywhere because it helped bring people together to comfort them. TV, politics, sports, and religion are common communities that people can obsess over, much like franchises. It's just that fandoms are a newer development and haven't been completely accepted by society yet. This is the concept of collective identity, an individual's sense of belonging to a group or collective. In human evolutionary history, collective identity was crucial for the physical survival of early humans, as they were too weak and slow to survive predators on their own and had to be very social and reliant on the group to survive. Humans enter an altered state of consciousness where they do not feel fear and pain, do not question the behavior of other members of their group, and are willing to sacrifice their lives for evolution's more important superordinate goals. There's a connection here to martyrdom or people sacrificing themselves for a cult. In contemporary times, identities are spread far and wide, especially with the internet, and people join communities for intellectual and emotional protection rather than physical survival. The human need to belong with a group makes fandoms exist for people who don't identify with anything else as strongly, and allows people to have a large group of identifiable people larger than a fun group, a group large enough that can run into a stranger from a fandom and quickly relate to each other and become friends a back to fall on for emotional and intellectual support, support for artistic endeavors, with the internet you can get all of this on demand. This is a culture that encourages people to divide and seclude themselves and their interests more than ever before, forcing more and more people to find a collective identity outside of the people they can physically access. A need to fit in improves one's devotion to their community for more acceptance, can manifest into attention horny behavior when fanatics seek validation. This leads to people embarrassing themselves or committing social suicide to show they don't care about any other community than that one, in hopes that it would weaken the bond of other communities and strengthen the bond with one. This is why people have unhealthy obsessions that can manifest in cringe. This is Forrest Vika Topa, signing out.